So basically about a month ago we ran a poll and you guys chose uh, what you wanted to work on for the next month um, for the community theme and it was creature design that won. I'll run another poll um, tomorrow or today later <clears throat> for our next theme that we'll do a month from now um, or a couple of weeks from now. Um, so what I did was I gave you guys some restrictions and the restrictions are what you're supposed to have designed the creature around. So. This is the resource pack. So these were the bits that I showed to be inspired by um, extra large. So that was different creature designs from movies. And I kind of wanted you guys to work just like this. Um, what the hell? Oh, OK, it's on the other screen. Sorry. <laughs> um, so just like this, I wanted you guys to try something new. And you had the option of going chimera or like, you know, a combination of different animals and um, and kind of creating like your own little combination of their anatomy and man managing to mix their skeletal structure together. Or you could have made a whole new alien creature just like this by using different pieces of anatomy from other animals that we have. So this little mantis piece and the weird skeletal or insect kind of um, joint structure for the legs. Um, this is entirely new, um, kind of out of the gates of hell. and. Um, the uh, insect-like or beetle-like armor at the top, and then some more really uh, armor, really like, um, like kind of mechanical, like kind of designed armor for the body. So it's like a engineered kind of an alien, um, kind of kind of like a weapon or something. So that leads me to my next point, which was you find a function or a habitat for it. So you're, you're inspired by this format. Um, or, uh, oh yeah, chimera or alien, and then you choose a habitat for them. And I gave two really, really limited, really specific habitats. Because that's kind of how it comes in with animals. Animals don't really, you know, cross over habitats. It's really what the kind of species they're from, even if it's like a subspecies of a different kind of animal, of the same kind of animal, you know, they're scattered around, along different kinds of, <clears throat> varying kinds of habitats. Um, for instance, in the Himalayas, there is this kind of, um, like a deer or like a, alpaca type thing. I don't know what it is, but um, it the, the air up there is so thin that uh, they breathe very, very slowly. They take really big breaths. Um, and it's like, and like they're, they're really specific. It's all about the breath. So it's all about the function and how the animal molds into their habitat, how the animal's anatomy changes according to the habitat that they're in. Um, so this this really really uh, specific, I don't know what it's what it, it has antlers and everything it's like a deer, but it lives in the Himalayas and like it lives in a really really high low oxygen habitat. So its lungs are huge, its legs are short, it can't run long long distances. I mean I think its legs are long because it can't run long distances, so it has to cover as much space as possible. Um, it does its old same old thing as other deer, or um, you know it fights with its antlers. Males have antlers, females don't. Uh, but it's just an amazing animal and to think that its entire anatomy was changed just because it, it changed in altitude along a, like along a, a different kind of environment, different kind of habitat. So that is entirely in your power. That becomes your tool as the character, I mean the concept artist for the creature design. You have to think about all of these different facets. So there's a lot of uh, biology, a lot of physics, and a lot of... Um, yeah, biology still uh, when it comes to designing animals. So you have to learn the, the respiratory system, the skeletal structure, um, the the way the animals function is what it's what 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 different parts does it use or need? For instance, a mountain goat has way stronger legs and, and uh, more restructured or I don't know what the word is, but the joints are so reinforced because it has to do so much climbing. It's it, even its skeletal structure was kind of muscularized in order to match um, its habitat. So that's something really, really big that I wanted to, 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 to cover. Um, what kind of animal is it? It doesn't always have to fly if it's a sky habitat. It can live very, very high, so it can be like a mountain goat. Uh, but the restrictions were um, <clears throat> faceted in one other way, which was these creatures right here are what I, is what I gave you to work with. So these kinds of creatures, and you take a little bit out of every single you know, one of these photos, or you can take a couple of them. You don't have to use them all. 
but you use them all to combine um, their anatomy, either as a chimera or a whole new alien structure. And between each piece that you choose, you can fill in the anatomy with another kind of, like you, can, you could have chosen a lion body, but it had to have all of these pieces here. So I'm the commissioner, I'm the guy with the movie pitch who's coming to you saying, okay, you know, this superhero is from this kind of... Um, planet and he misses his planet and remembers the animals of this planet. You can't just flash back to his planet and not design the earth, not to, not to choose the kind of gravity that planet has, not to uh, think about the exact place that he was, the biome or whatever it's called. Um, was it humid? Was it dry? Was it desert? Was it high? Was it, you know, you really have to ask all kinds of questions just to create that five second scene in a movie and to give it a real life example of this, if you guys remember from Man of Steel, um, the, the planet, when they when they uh, flash back to that, lasted like a minute, but they spent so much character and creature design on that one scene. It's ridiculous. Probably the most expensive, one of the most expensive scenes in the entire movie because of all the planning and the creation that went into it. So let me find it for you. Um, <clears throat> Krypton. It's the animals um, that I really wanted to show you. <clears throat> let me find it. It was that one scene right here, this creature right here, and it was like this long shot of the landscape of Krypton and the kind of uh, environment it was, and the animals that flew in it. Also, the animals that they that they flew on, those creatures that they used. Um, I guess it was a really, really high density planet that had a lot of gravity. That's why Superman, when he came to the Earth, he could fly because the gravity wasn't as strong as him. He was more dense. So the animals there had four wings, I think, to deal with that gravity and to, to be able to fight that back. What an amazing way to, to react to a restriction is to give it four wings in order to, to reach that high peak with it being so heavy and it not being a bird. It wasn't a bird, it was a reptile. It was a flying reptile. So uh, you have to think about all of these things. This is the kind of stuff I want you guys to think about. I don't always want you guys drawing faces and characters. Um, creatures is another massive way to test yourself. It's another massive way to keep yourself um, on your toes, asking whether or not do you really think like a creator. And that's what an artist is. They create they put things together, pieces together, things that already were, imagine their own kind of anatomy and bring it together to create a whole new object, a whole new crea uh, creation. So we're not here trying to actually, you know, um, spawn new creatures or create new creatures or generate new biology. We're, we're the artists. All we have to do is draw it. So we have a lot of freedom and a lot of power just with our pencil and our paper. So let me see what everyone is um, saying. <clears throat> Um, I've been watching nothing but walking uh, with dinosaurs, monsters, beasts to make sure the anatomy would work um, and not just pulling it stuff out of my ass. That's, that's, that's cool. Uh, that's actually exactly what I want you guys. I kind of recommended that four weeks ago. I said watch a lot of documentaries, watch the way animals move, the kind of documentaries are amazing. They serve so much, especially for anthropologically, just looking at documentaries and seeing how people live in different areas, at different heights, different altitudes, different kinds of environments, um, how people deal with it and how they've evolved as well. So let's get started. The way I'm going to critique these is I'm going to critique them very specifically. I'm going to first talk about the gesture line. The gesture line is <clears throat> sort of a reiteration of its organic pattern, the animal's organic pattern. So a gesture line that we use on an animal kind of, kind of really in one quick fell swoop designs the character, designs the animal. Even when you do silhouette, so I know silhouette is one great way to get started, kind of deciding the animal's spine gesture so it's really the spine where the gesture sits and even in human anatomy when we say gesture line we're always talking about something that passes through or is part of or is the spine itself so when we think about the spine of the animal what kind of animal it is the spine of a cheetah is very different very different than the spine of a lion uh, one is more geared to the jaw and one is more geared aerodynamically for the speed so you can do so much anatomy and address so much kind of ana a lot of anatomy um, with just the spine. All right. So that's what I really want. I'm going to be testing that to see if you thought about the spine and the kind of creature and how the spine reacts to the environment, and what the what the creature's function is in reaction to its environment. Um, another uh, thing that I'm going to be testing is attached to that spine, of course, is the anatomy and the structure of the animal. So are its legs short where they should be short? Is the animal supposed to cross long distances? Is it supposed to be tall? Um, is it supposed to be um, kind of like a 
belly crawler. It's supposed to be just, just really stay low, um, insect eater kind of animal, staying really close to the ground. That's really where it lives. It's on the ground. Is it a really tall animal? Is its main source of food really high? That's explaining giraffes and the length of giraffes. Um, really, if you think about the two extremes, you know, high or low, dry or wet, um, you, you can address a lot of the anatomy at this stage um, just by answering those questions. So a lot of you, I'm not sure of the exact um, thinking process behind your character creature designs, uh, but I hope that you guys asked yourself these questions. This is if you ever get hired by a studio to create this kind of um, work for them, you're going to have to answer all these questions. In fact, they're going to ask you these questions specifically. They're going to come in with a pre-written kind of blurb for the animal that they want to see in their project, and you're going to have to answer all those questions. You're going to have to think about all of that. So being an artist isn't just locking yourself in your room and drawing all day and drawing faces till you get better at faces. It's, it's turning on Netflix and watching some... Uh, <clears throat> documentaries, going online and watching some documentaries, looking at diagrams of animals, looking how animals give birth, looking at how animals die, looking at how animals eat. Um, all of that explains a lot about uh, what is what what the animal is mostly, what what it's supposed to be designed. So it's jaw structure, like the hyena, is it that strong? Uh, the strongest jaw structure because it's pretty much got no power everywhere else in its body except its neck. Its neck is unbelievably large for its body because it's re supporting and restructuring that jawline that it has and the rest of its body is so short because all it has to do is work in packs and bring the creature down with a really really strong bite because it's got no weight up here but a, but a lion, if you've ever seen the body of a lion, it's just pure muscle. It's all strength. It's equally divided across the body and that's why it's such a beautiful creature to look at because it's um, it's got the jaw strength, it's got the spine strength, it's got the body strength, upper body, lower body strength, it's got those strong long legs but not too long that it's losing strength in them. Um, it's short. It, a lion, really a cat, is really like the image of beauty um, in my opinion in the animal kingdom. Um, <clears throat> not just because I like cats, but because of the big cats, the way you can see the way big cats are designed. Uh, but yeah, so you have to answer all these questions when you're designing them. Another thing I'm going to look at is whether or not you've stuck to the references. So uh, those references I chose as if I'm the guy paying you $5,000 for all these creature designs. I'm going to be the one going in there and saying whether or not you really followed or deciding whether or not you really follow the stuff, the guidelines that I wrote in my blurb for you to design, which is basically the photos that I chose. So you could have combined this headpiece and the aerodynamic shape of this underwater animal to be in the sky because you need aerodynamic as much as an aerodynamic shape <clears throat> as much underwater as you need it above water, um, especially in the sky if you're flying. So that compared to the way the armadillo's armor is layered, so it's like reinforced um, instead of one piece attached to another piece with a seam in between, this just kind of layers on top and it gives it so much mobility and allows it to sort of gain that circular shape that it does <clears throat> when it's uh, when it's running away or something. Um, horns, if it's the kind of animal that is confrontational, usually we find these with, with herbivores. So is the animal a carnivore or a herbivore? Um, I'm not sure if you guys asked yourself these questions. Lots and lots of questions. Um, if it's a sky animal and it has these kinds of wings, it must be a really light animal. If it's light, it can't carry armor. It still has to have an aerodynamic shape. If it does have to be really light and scaling walls or scaling the sides of mountains, it can have armor just like the ant does um, and moments of relief in between the armor. So those little light pieces that distribute the, the force and the impact and kind of just, um, if the, uh, the more dense the animal, the less, um, the more it's going to sustain impact and to sort of hog in that all that force. So the reason why these guys can fall from the ceiling of my washroom all the way down um, and still survive is because of their ability to, to disperse all of that force on impact. So that applies a lot to an animal that is really high in the sky. Um, if it can fall, will it die? If, it, if it's always flying, um, <clears throat> that might be its defense that if it falls, it can disperse its um, force through its the relief in its armor. If it's a crawler, a belly crawler kind of animal, its legs should be short. So that's really what we see in all of these animals. So this can fly, it's a little piece of both, but its legs are pretty short in the way it crawls. Its stomach really takes a lot of that friction. Any animal that, that is really um, close to the ground has really, really short legs. It has no need for long legs. And, legs. and we find that um, in uh, the snake is the extreme of that, where there's no legs at all. It's just all muscle and spine. The snake really is where uh, you, you're going to get tested in your ability to do gesture lines. Anyone who's ever drawn a snake, you know that you have to have a believable gesture that seems like a lot of muscles, hundreds of muscles are going in to moving that one spine. Um, 
So that's something you could have used. So a, a, a short belly crawler kind of snake body with really, really short lizard-like legs or no legs at all with layering armor. And if it's not a herbivore or it's an omnivore, it could have had tiny little horns. This could have been a texture. So I added this in to, for a texture to kind of show off how the texture might be of the animal. Um, this is kind of like the bone structure. The more holes it has in its bone structure, the more it can disperse forces and the bone won't break. But the more um, empty those holes are actually, the more uh, the, there's kind of two extremes of that, the more susceptible it is to breaking. Um, if it's a snake that can fly, is it is it a long snake? Is it heavy? Is it hollow on the inside like we see with the exoskeleton of, a, of, a, of an insect um, or a flying insect? So all of that was really what I wanted you guys to experiment with, to think about. Um, I'm going to be talking about all of that um, as I go. So the way the anatomy ties into the habitat, the use of references, whether or not you stuck to the references. If you don't stick to the references, it's a point off. <laughs> not really sure what you get if you have all the points, but um, the structure, structure and the function and the anatomy. And then finally, gesture line um, and, and how all of that really, really leads back to the gesture line. Your initial first stroke kind of decides whether or not it's a successful design, a, a, a functioning design for a creature. Um, all right, so let's see what uh, everyone's saying. <clears throat> okay, so um, everyone just start paying attention now, okay? Dinosaurs would be an artist's idea of how they move, though. Uh, all right. I really wish I had time to take part in this. It's okay. Um, you don't have to. Uh, just being here will, will kind of get you, get the ball rolling with the kinds of things you're supposed to be thinking about when designing a creature. Um, so let's get started with these. I'm also, uh, in addition to all of that stuff I'm going to be looking at, I'm also going to uh, talk about form and whether or not you've re reacted to the light or not. The good old cube that I always talk about. <clears throat> okay, so this creature right here, I feel like it's an, you did really, really well but ha by having it... Um, crawl so it's a belly crawler and you, you gave it short legs that's really really good I love how you use that I think the armor is layered or you intended for it to be layered if you wanted it to be layered there should have been it feels like this animal might be attacked from the top by birds so you have to think about what the animal's prey is and what's preying on that animal as well you guys should be taking these notes down if you really want to make your next creature design pop and really uh, leave a, an impact on your viewers. You should be writing these questions, these, these questions down, all of this stuff. Um, so if the animal is being preyed on from the top, I like how you added the armor at the top. Um, it seems very fitting. But because it's a snake that kind of moves like an armadillo, so the armadillo kind of just rolls up, rolls up into a ball and then straightens out. That's very similar to what a snake does, kind of just flattens out or curves. Um, so I feel like the animal should have uh, had a layering kind of a layered armor because it kind of feels like this is being like a cast. It's being, um, it's constricting the animal. So to do something like that, all we really have to do is just lengthen one on the other. That would have felt more um, mechanical for me, like it's an actual, uh, like if you ever seen the way we design robots. It's very, very much like an insect, the way we distribute uh, weight around the, the robot and stuff. Little tiny robots that move and fight. You know those little war robots? <clears throat> like battle robots or something? So it's kind of really the same thing. It's just, just so that we're thinking about the way it defends itself. So this feels like it can close and open if you layer them on top of each other instead of, instead of them having ridges. Which kind of doesn't seem fitting feels like it's a really large scale and the larger the scale the less motion it has the less um, the more the less joints it has so the less joints the less motion so I would probably wherever it compresses I would probably layer them on top of each other so these plates kind of layer close closer to each other when it compresses and they kind of just stretch when the animal is kind of curving so you just have to find the points where the animal has entered the curve and then started straightening out again and that's when you kind of leave more space in between each plate. <clears throat> Another thing that really, really gets on my nerves um, is that this looks like a Pokemon. Um, we, 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 there is so much anatomy available. I know you might have chosen, so let's let's see which one you might have chosen. You chose the armadillo. You chose the snake. I think you chose the lizard face. 
I'm not sure, or this guy right here. But even then, there's so much anatomy. So here, it doesn't feel like there's a skeletal structure. It feels like a, a, a plush, plush doll. But over here, there's a lot of skeletal structure. You can see where um, it kind of gets fatty, where the brain might be right over here. The temple's right over here, and the kind of uh, brow bone that it has, and then the snout. And then how it's really just a lot of blubber. It's the weirdest little creature. So you could have used this, and the, fat, the softer its tip is, which you had that, the easier it would be to crawl under sand, um, or to, to get around sand. There's less, uh, like it's more aerodynamic, but for the sand, for crawling under sand. So it's really similar to water. So there's a lot of anatomy that is available in this photograph, and that's a massive issue that some of you have. You don't trust your anatomy. You don't trust the anatomy in your references. If you don't have trust for your reference, you're not going to retain that infor information, that reference information, later on when you're designing another creature. All your creatures are going to look like Pokemon. Um, so really, really think about uh, what this creature is, what, the, how the creature looks with all the flesh removed. All creatures have a skeletal structure, either it's on the outside or the inside. Um, when you're designing creatures without a skeleton, it doesn't feel, it feels like a lot of anatomy is missing. If you've ever seen a character, person without a skeleton, it would look really weird. It would just look like bags of flesh. Skeleton is really important. So there's a lot of skeletal structure missing in the head. Um, the teeth also don't look like the teeth of a carnivore, especially considering that this is an insect type of hunter. Really high mobility um, in kind of a barren environment, so it has to have a really, really heightened sense of like its ability to hunt, heightened sense of smell or sound. So when it does capture its creature, how does it make the fatal blow? Either by crushing it to death and then finally eating. Um, snakes have uh, crazy teeth. Um, is it venomous? So all of these questions are, are applicable here. So I'm going to add in some teeth and then some really, really basic anatomy. I'm going to try to use my, my brush. Oop. So I'm going to keep this reference nearby and see if I can... Use it. Also, a really large eye really doesn't do much if the creature isn't dependent on its vision. So think about an eagle. Everyone answer my question. Does an eagle depend on its vision to catch its prey? I'm going to just wait for people to answer. The answer is very, very obvious. Um, freedom. Okay, so yes, it does. <laughs> it does depend on its and its eyes to catch its prey. Prey, so it's got an extra extended brow bone that gives it shade from the sun when it's really high. It's got an unbelievably large pair of eyes, and um, it's kind of got multi vision. So it's not for one stream of vision. It's got bifocal, so it can see from two angles. Which is something I learned from some of you actually. Thank you for that. So this creature can see shit from really, really high. It can see a mouse. Um, from, from in between the bushes, I remember from Zabumafu when I was a kid, we used to watch that show. And they did an episode on eagles and how far they can see. But if, let's think about a snake. Um, there's a specific kind of snake that's almost blind. Um, that, can, that doesn't need its eyes to see its prey. So it's got really, really weak vision. I think it's this one. Um, and what it does, how it does sense its, its uh, surroundings, I think, is by its sense of smell and its tongue. So what it does is it kind of senses the changes in its environment. Um, I think it also senses uh, footsteps or, or kind of shuffling with its, uh, with its little bits right here. So it can kind of track down an animal that way with that heightened sense of, uh, sense of smell and sense of taste. Um, I think it smells with its tongue and with its nose. So that's why its tongue is so unbelievably large. So whatever it uses, whatever the animal uses, that's the largest part of the animal. It's really that it's just that easy. That's the part that Mother Nature enlarged to saying, okay, fine, I accept your application. You really need your eyes to be really big because you can fly really high because I gave you really big wings. Okay, here you go. Have some big eyes to help you out. That's the only way the animal could have survived so long, so many years after snowstorms and rainstorms and the animal's still alive. It's because it's managed to adapt and gain and enlarge that one bit. So the way I would have added more anatomy is I would just have shrunk the eyes. I don't think it needs those big eyes. We're so prone to drawing big eyes because of our, you know, character design. And that's the problem. When you spend too long drawing faces, you go into drawing animals, you have no idea where to start. 
So I'm just thinking about its aerodynamic structure. Maybe it pounces or attacks with its snout. So it needs some sharpness. Shrunk its eye. Um, when a snake opens its mouth, especially this guy here, there's always a little bit of flesh right around here. So that's a little bit of flesh where it kind of cuts off. But reptilian faces, especially the, the lizard, if the lizard opens its mouth, it's got this extra skin like a dragon's cheek, but it's like a second cheek in between the upper and lower jaw. So you could have added that in there as well to make the face seem a little bit... You had it a little bit, but I think it needs a way more than that. You really need to signal that there's an entire anatomical me me mechanism behind opening and closing its jaws. Wherever there's a lot of movement, there is a lot of muscle, even on the human body. So which hand, which, oh, sorry, I gave it away, fuck, <laughs> which part of the body has the most muscles in it? Oh, the hand. Um, and tendons and skeletons, I think it has the most skeletons in it, or skeletal pieces, um, joints and stuff. Is the hand, because there's so much motion behind it. The strongest muscle in the entire body is the tongue, because it's just talking like I'm doing right now. That, that is the thing that moves the most, that's going to be the biggest, strongest thing. So we need way more anatomy over here. You have way too much anatomy in this area. And not enough anatomy where it really matters. This scary-ass, venom-filled jaw of that creature that's hiding under the sand. So this would not have been a successful uh, concept design if you were being hired for it. This is not something that you can really represent yourself with, so it's still, it's still early. Uh, it needs a little bit more studies, but if you can address just the face and make the face look less Pokemon and more really like a real predator, I think this is way, way more than ready for a portfolio piece. You can add this in. It's beautiful. You did the colors well, the saturation, the, the, the gesture is beautiful. The gesture matches the animal, so it's a really curvy gesture to match its snake-like uh, form. But... Um, I'm just going to keep painting on it, trying to find and bring in different anatomy. Where the So let's find a, the lizard. The lizard is reptilian, so let's see how the nostrils work. They're very up, they're, they're lifted up. So the eyes are no longer functioning properly, so what happens is the nose and the tongue takes over. So the sound it's making right now, is it making a sound, like the gesture it's making with its mouth, is it making a sound or is it ready to attack? All of that stuff applies. So if it's making a sound, um, what kind of sound is it? Where is that sound coming from? Is it rattling its, t its, its throat, making that weird hissy sound um, with its tongue? Or is it um, rattling its tail? What is this attack of? What, what, what instance of this animal's function are we seeing? So I'm just trying to make the nose feel like it's protruding. taking over what the eyes are lacking and giving it a little bit more anatomy by thinking about the lizard. Um, the lizard's face is also kind of the skeleton you can see where it enters in so the lizard actually has pretty good sight um, but right over here it kind of connects into the skeleton so you're trying to make it a seamless kind of anatomy and it just kind of connects into the nose right along here. Make it look menacing, make it look like there's just a little bit too much skeleton visible through the flesh. <clears throat> All of that will help. What is its last mode of defense? You really have to think about that. When the animal is captured and its armor is no longer working, there has to be one more mode of defense. There has to be. So those stick creatures, if they are found, and you know they look like sticks, they actually look like sticks, they're so part of their environment um, they look like a they look like a stem. They look like a stick insect. What, what's their last? Like I have to research it. But what's the last mode of, of of defense? What's the last way they defend themselves? I think they can pinch. I'm not sure. I remember very well. But when an animal attacks them, I think they can pinch. They can go on living with yes. This is one thing. They can go on living with one leg missing or two legs missing. They can still find their way around. If there's two missing on one side, I think they're pretty fucked. Um, but look at how part of this its habitat it is. I'm surprised none of you like made a rock animal. Like that would have been really really cool. Um, so desert and sky both would have been applicable. How would it climb? I guess it would have some sort of insect-like lightness to it, but it would look like a rock for a sky creature. 
but especially for a for a desert terrain animal I'm surprised I didn't see any like actual rock shapes it's really the camouflage in the guide I kind of asked a couple questions maybe next time I should ask more questions like how does it camouflage how does it breed how is it herbivore is it a carnivore so I'm just adding some surface the texture I'm sure it wants to camouflage it has some sort of camouflage this is a very easy pattern to spot from the sky so you might want to give this animal a little bit more defense just like that nothing big it's the tiniest little changes that kind of merge it into its environment and really at the end of the day to create camouflage is the way you know um, form patterns for rocks so um, like terraforming how it feels to paint rocks it's pretty much what you're repeating onto an onto the animal's surface um, I think it should be a little bit more I think the color is fine it's a really menacing color like a red centipede if you've ever seen those they're disgusting um, but other than that really that's all I had I think the jawline is in the wrong spot for the depth so what happens is right now what's being tested is your ability to create depth so you haven't hidden enough of one side and to create the feeling of it opening or kind of just yelling it has to be from this joint and it has to be hidden just a little bit more so this angle this corner should still look like it matches this corner where the way you had it before is it was it didn't feel like it felt like it was twisted to the side and the way to make it feel like it's actually still attached is just to cast a shadow from the top piece to the to the lower piece just like this and because there's a lot of light shining through you have a chance for subsurface scattering just on the sides oops just using my um, dodge tool for this just a little bit right along, along here so I, I would still put the the jaw a little bit closer I think all I have to do really is just liquefy filter liquefy so do you see how many questions go into this process it's it's not just you know we're artists we're creators we're engineers we have to engineer the animal everyone write that back to me I'm not sure what this line is is it is it the tongue I think it should have um, a tongue because this the desert is so bright that usually animals that live in the desert have really really tiny eyes um, or really uh, like eyes that have been designed or, or evolved in a way where they're no longer in danger from direct sunlight and if they are have unnaturally large eyes what happens is they have this massive hood um, on the eye to protect them so that's what an eyebrow is really in the brow bone it's just shade from the sun so your eye can can function What I'm doing is just adding an extra tail so that because the eyes are so small that the um, tail, the tongue is taking over and um, helping it find its way around the desert, finding animals, animal droppings so it can find its prey and eat and live and reproduce. That's the goal of every animal ever, either to die off in, in extinction um, or to, to reproduce and continue and eat and, and, and fuck. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's pretty much what the, the goal of every creature that is not mortal that's the goal of every creature that is mortal sorry if anything is immortal it doesn't really it's not really concerned with that and I've yet to find an immortal animal I heard lobsters are immortal but I don't know <clears throat> okay so just adding some really basic brush strokes for that um, so let's take a look at how it looked before so it is very different before it was very very uh, basic anatomy just to show because this is a lack that you have right now and what you have to do is, is counter that lack um, with some studies and some some more experience you see how the ridges here looked very um, very uh, kind of didn't feel like they functioned with the shape and the movement of the snake they kind of just felt like they were in the way like sponges this is supposed to be hard so reinforced just like we see with the armadillo reinforced um, is really what we're looking for so layering on top of each other okay so you really really need to look into more creature anatomy um, really try to explore some skeleton skeletal diagrams see what they what they're all about okay so let's talk about this one 
Um, I think the mostly the issue that I have with this one is color. Um, the reason why certain animals have color, pretty much what science has told us, is that they're attracting a mate. Um, when it comes to animals that are like rhino-like, or actually, let's see if you... Yeah, animals that are rhino-like, like big animals, the way they catch or attract their, their, their mate, I hear rhinos chase after each other until the female is tired and then boom. Um, or elephants, I hear they, um, they mate for a life and the way they find their mate is by the call or something. I, I really don't remember exactly with elephants, but there is marking for all animals. All animals mark, um, you know, when they're ready to mate or whatever. So really the only role that we know of um, to, that, that is indicative of evolution and the way evolution works is that the colors are for the male or the extra colors are for the male. Um, and if it's a creature that is always um, colored like a flamingo, it's just going to have a little bit more scent to it. I think the female has a specific scent. Um, there's, a, there's a dance, there's a call. But for this, this is not a bird, and it's a little bit in between a rhino and, um, and, a, and a bug. Like, not the structure of a bug, the shortness of a bug. So I wouldn't give it any color, uh, because it doesn't look like it's flaunting. I think it's like a runner. A runner animal so that's just like a rhino if you ever seen the body of a rhino really really stubby but these strong ass muscly legs because the animal is a runner um, because it's a runner I wouldn't give it colors it kind of feels like it's not it, you're giving it two different kinds of biologies um, and uh, I would really take away its color you have to think about its predator its common predator might be like a pack of coyotes or coyote like animals attacking it from the bottom so animals that are shorter than it it seems like it's a herbivore a gentle giant I really wouldn't find it finding any use with color um, again you can make it like a rainbow you know that's the power of art but to make it make sense to put it into a movie and say hey this is an animal um, is really just to give it to, to take away from its, from its color. Um, I would definitely take away the red. Um, and saying that the red you chose as well was a little bit uh, gaudy and a little bit warm, uh, considering that it's in a desert environment. So it's the color of an animal is also dependent on its diet. So if, if it is a herbivore eating bugs and not really. Uh, herbivores don't really eat bugs, but if it's kind of an omnivore herbivore eating bugs and lots of shrubbery and lots of leaves and <clears throat> different foliage, it's not going to have enough diet. Like the flamingo is pink because of the shrimp that it eats, unless that's been changed. The only place I would put some red, so I'm taking away the red, so where I'm using it next is really going to matter, is areas where it's just really, really sensitive. Areas that are attractive to a pack of coyotes where they would attack first. So the throat would definitely get a little bit more redness to it. Not a lot of skeleton, not a lot of armor. Pure flesh, pure sensitive. This is where you go to kill the creature. On its stomach lining, just at the very bits. So the closest bits to the bottom. So its strength is up here, its weakness is down here. I also get the surrounding color, so it has to kind of mix in with the rest of its... It doesn't seem like it's a lone lone animal. So what I would do is I would kind of give it some color of the environment. Actually just drop tool the color and just throw it on. Its feet have very little anatomy. That's fine because you told us you haven't finished it yet. But if you ever do finish the feet, I recommend something really, really um, leathery. Uh, lots of armor because of the heat of the floor of the desert. Heat is one massive thing you guys have to think about. So this creature, how does it cool itself down? So the way the elephant cools itself down is by its big fat ears, uh, kind of like a fan, and its tail uh, to wave off animals, which is a lot of the common uh, characteristics of animals of the Serengeti. Their tail is always helping them wave off flies, wave off other creatures, and keep it cool. It rolls around in the dirt. If an animal rolls around in the dirt to keep itself cool, then it's going to get the color of the dirt along with it. That's why that red kind of really didn't match. It felt like it was a newly washed car. It needs to be a little dirty so it can cool itself down. <clears throat> also, since the sky is blue, um, to talk about form, uh, we need a little bit more light on the animal. Really high spikes of light. Oops. Just around the very peaks and all the way above on the armor. <clears throat> So does everyone get these these uh, points I'm making? Does anyone have any questions so far? 
the temperature is a really really massive thing so I'm thinking if you guys did a flying creature um, that was rock shaped or no 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 the flying creature that was light not rock shaped um, it would have something to keep itself warm because it's so cool up there and something to keep it breathing because the oxygen levels are so um, are so uh, low submerge down I'm gonna use a uh, highlighter just because the sun is shining on it so it feels like there's gonna be a spike in the in the color and then I'm going to get color mode and make it yellow because that's pink because um, dodge tool doesn't really give a fuck it's like the honey badger to keep ourselves in the same theme okay um, so it's a herbivore it's the color of its environment because it keeps itself cool all the reds and pinks are down here uh, maybe over here this little bit of color is how it attracts its mate so that you know I, I'm, it really just depends and um, I would kind of keep it the same a little bit of subsurface scattering under right here so there's different density levels when it comes to animals and their flesh And, uh, you can just use this as an opportunity to bring in some stippling all kinds of fun stuff to show off its surface texture so wherever there's light you have a chance to show off lots and lots of surface texture so a little bit of I would use a thicker brush and a harder brush than soft brush actually actually it's just a really piece of shit brush <laughs> but I use it because it covers lots of space so it's fast um, yeah, I like the way that it was rendered as well. Really, really nice. Um, fleshy, long strokes, really organic patterns, and then really rigid, um, hard strokes for the for the uh, armor. Um, it feels like it's a really big animal. It feels like it's like a half the size of, a, of an elephant or something looking at the rocks here. So we're seeing all kinds of different rocks. So desert rocks really aren't that numerous and it's pretty much they're all pummeled into sand so if there are any rocks they're just like remnants really really big pieces of whatever was there before <clears throat> why didn't you just send it in free for fire just send in what you had already So we'll take a look at the before. I'm still really, really iffy because the more he moves um, around the ground, the more there's going to be surface uh, disruption. So there's going to be a lot of floating. Wherever he's moving, there's going to be sand in the air. There's going to be lots of dirt. So what happens is there's going to be that, that dirt's going to just toss itself right on his body. And there's not going to be a lot of chance for that red to come through. It's going to be like a thick layer until over, over hundreds and millions of, or thousands of years, I guess, the animals actually just took that color. It's like, okay, I give up. Let me just be brown. Looks very chicken-like. I like this. <clears throat> so throwing in that sand wherever he's moving really made him a part of his environment. Oh my god, I almost lost this. Okay. I'm a bad. Okay. So do you see how um, pink he was? Uh, I think he would be pink if he was in a tropical environment. So if he was in some sort of lots and lots of water, lots of sun, lots of food to eat, uh, colored food like salmon or some other weird berry that they eat for thousands of years until it became this version of itself, I think that would be the place where it would, it would fit in, the color would fit in. Because this sticks out like a sore thumb. A bunch of you know, hungry ass, haven't eaten for weeks, coyotes, see this across on the horizon, they're going to attack it. If they can see it, they're going to go towards it, and they're likely going to see this animal. But they most likely will not see this guy um, with his pack of babies and his wife um, walking through the desert, or they're less likely to see him. And if they do, he's got this massive turtle jaw right here, and I'll just snap those fuckers in half. All right? So a little bit of surface disturbance will explain a lot about the animal's role and its environment. And the gesture line here is perfect, by the way. The gesture line is nice and closed. So I talk a lot about what open and closed gestures are in my book. Um, closed gestures are pretty much just imitate a circle. They're very closed, so it's a very slow-moving animal. But an animal that has high agility, it's got lots and lots of joints, lots of movement, lots of areas of movement. 
Um, even though this is a runner, if it wants to, it's, it can be slow because of this massive weight on it. Um, but uh, but a cheetah, the way a cheetah's gesture lines work is they're very, very open. They're very fluid. Uh, lots of joints of movement, so it's a fast animal. But it's also very weak. So a closed gesture for animals represents strength or, or rigidity or tankiness. I'm going to talk about this in a sec. Um, this animal is another ground animal. Um, I'm also questioning its color, the use of color in here. So what we have in our references, uh, the inspiration, is that there's very little color, uh, especially if it's an animal that lives in uh, in sort of a desert terrain or a closed terrain. Um, this kind of feels like it's an animal that lives in the forest or a, a tropical environment like the rainforest with lots of greens in it. You have to make the animal match its environment. But over here, you see where the pink is? The only bit of pink is used on fleshy areas that is very uh, gummy or, or tongue or um, just like really fleshy areas that don't have any of that excess skin or armor or that calloused kind of thing. Right here too, only the flesh gets the color. Everywhere else is pretty monochromatic. But anywhere that doesn't have armor, very, very fleshy. But you had lots and lots of red on the armor. God, that looks so wrong. Um, and then over here, same thing, snot, snot, uh, what is it called again? Snout, and the, the gummy areas, and the very belly, like just the belly areas are getting that redness to them. And then the teeth are herbivore teeth, so they're not very, uh, not carnivorous, but pretty monochromatic everywhere else. Lots of surface disturbance right here in the way the animal moves. And um, really, like, it looks like just a bunch of warts on the animal because it's got all its defense down here. And it's got, like, hooves to help it with the um, uh, terrain, the heat of the terrain. The way it cools itself down is probably with its tail or running around in the, in the, in the, in the sand. Um, over here, same thing. It's a hot, it's a kind of a hot environment. I don't know why an ape lives in this hot environment. It's just sad when that happens because they get so hot so agitated, um, but uh, this pretty much is based off an ape design, it's just got more legs, so it's got one more stability, but again, the flesh and the flesh colors over here, lots of surface disturbance on the sand. Um, asking yourself how it eats, is it a herbivore, is it a carnivore? I guess this is just a caged animal, it's probably its main source of food is fruits or other kind of vegetation doesn't really have, I mean, if you call these canines, I don't know, it just feels like a really, really angry ape. But if you remember in the scene in the movie from John Carter, um, it probably just really a pissed off animal. But if it's a very ape-like creature, so lots of bugs, lots of greens. So yeah, back to this is I really just want to see the color only where it really is needed. Bugs, like um, Egyptian beetles or Egyptian bugs, uh, bugs of Egypt, have lots and lots of color to them. Because their their um, their main source of food are is just other bugs and plants and all this kind of stuff. So the colors they have to them, I guess, I think, is an indication of their poison or a way to attract a mate. But you can also roll a piece of shit together and give it to your wife. But uh, really, just a lot of monochromatic bugs. <clears throat> if you want to think like a bug, like locusts or spiders. Just very, very earthy colors to match with the ground. Lots of the color, I mean, the ones that come in color are just so odd and so rare. And I guess, yeah, it is an indication of them kind of making themselves, defending themselves or their diet or both. So the green here really, it's either you chose some really, really crazy uh, neon color for the bug or because it feels like a bug. Or, um, or you just make it the color of the of its surrounding environment because it just doesn't want to be eaten. Think about its prey and think about who preys on it. Um, this little bit here doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I think you're, it feels like it's not part of its anatomy. It's not very organic shape. You're using a sorry about that. You're using a geometric shape on a lot of organic shapes. So the circle, the gesture lines, the horns, the elongated face, the fly eyes, and then suddenly we have a triangle which really doesn't belong in there. Um, but, uh, but I can see, I guess, why you used it. Uh, this is also something I considered for my creature design uh, for when I sketched, is using just a, a really, really simple kind of um, 
shape that can go through the sand like a heel so that you can get through the sand easier or, or kind of just tiptoe over the sand instead of having such a flat but it's just like snowshoes so you use a really really wide flat foot or a wide hoof and it'll it'll make it easier to fly over this will make it um, to walk over this will make it more difficult if you really think about how heavy the object is if it's a bug if it's a, if it's like an insect and it's got all these tiny little heel shaped feet it'll fly, it'll it'll go right over because it's got multiple legs like six or eight or and really really skinny legs and the body is significantly short and small and light so all of these changes, I can't paint over really because it would have to would mean I have to repaint the entire object. I think you could have done something more. This big massive object it should not stay this massive and should not stay this basic. This late this late into canvas, it should have been divided into different pieces. Maybe you should have divided it into um, multiple pieces. Maybe like a grounded insect. And so this would be its belly or thorax or whatever. This would be the thorax, and then this would be the head and then kind of just kind of patch it up with some sort of uh, herbivore anatomy because it, cause it's got these horns. They're not really pincers. So I'd recommend breaking this piece up because it's just too big. At the end of the day, it's, it's how the gesture works. There's zero gesture here. Um, it's just, it's a big circle instead of an actual line of motion for the anatomy to travel on. Oops, okay. So for that one, I definitely recommend redesigning a little bit on the feet, uh, the role of the animal, what the animal does, its basic function. So a lot of points off. I like how you kept it monochromatic, and I like the design, like the, the design of the of the skin over here. Feels like it's the just exact shape of the. Look, it's a camouflage, so it kind of hides under the ground. Um, but still, a lot of a lot of choices could have been. A lot of different choices can be made. Okay. I'll look at the sketches in a sec because the sketches didn't really deal with color. This one, first, just straight off, you definitely need some subsurface scattering. Just right off the bat. <clears throat> right off the bat. Um, Alright, and then definitely some of the color. So the surrounding color. It's a bat, basically. You drew a bat. You drew a bat with a different kind of head. So um, it, there isn't much design really involved here. If I was the commissioner and I asked you, hey, make me like a bat-like creature that has... You know that that I don't know. I guess that can smell the air instead of really hear it. So no more echolocation. So it wouldn't have these humongous ears, but it would have uh, you know, this massive nose, like a big vampire bat nose, those freaky fucking vagina noses <laughs> on bats. <laughs> you ever seen a bat? Um, so sorry I said that. Um, but yeah, um, it just there's all kinds of all kinds of opportunities to be creative and I really just see a bat design here. I'm not sure what's happening in its mouth. Is that bioluminescence or something? Um, that would be cool. Actually just darkening the whole dude. Giving him like a blue color. Kind of just make him match his purpose. And then just darkening him. But I guess you're showing that it's darkened. So it's like the day has darkened outside so he's just starting to illuminate flying I really don't see the purpose though of a nocturnal animal um, if not in the water or something having bioluminescence because it really just would give away its position insects would see it coming the, the amazingness about the amazing thing about a bat is that it's just pitch black it's hard to catch at night it's hard to locate it travels in groups, so it's really hard to avoid once it chooses its, its insect. <clears throat> but if it's giving away its position, lighting up in the sky at night, it's a. Uh, it's not very good. Like a the bug, uh, the the firefly. I think it's the main suit food source. Let me actually just look it up. It's probably a nocturnal animal, of course. Um, but uh, they're very easy to spot at night. Um, uh, they're they're just they're giving away their position. They're just like free food flying around, and I'm sure the way they attract each other is by their bioluminescence. So, let's see which animals eat the firefly. <clears throat> um, predators. Uh, some adults do prey on animals. Lots of them abstain from feeding fully. 
I'm so curious now what eats fireflies. Because they're giving away their position at night, so what purpose does that serve? Um, uh, what eats fireflies? Let me search that up. Sorry, guys, I'm just so curious. <clears throat> Fireflies are carnivorous, they eat other fireflies. Um, frogs, so those are a little bit nocturnal, that's true. That's so crazy. The females attract the males and devour them. <laughs> spiders eat them, spiders are also nocturnal. That's crazy. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, all of that goes into why this shouldn't be bioluminescent. Um, it really doesn't make sense. There could be other animals, could be other birds. Um, birds are mostly uh, not nocturnal. Um, they probably fly in the day. It's easier for them to find food, to scavenge, especially seagulls and all that business. So um, don't recommend him. You basically just drew an, a, a really, really happy bat. So uh, kind of just think about the references you have in here. And I don't think there were any bats in that reference. Or there are a lot of references in there. Um... I have bats in this reference? I think I did. No. Oh, I did. Fuck, I did. Um, so, yeah, you redrew the bat. <laughs> you redrew the, you could have given him a snake body um, or a lizard face or some kind of armor. If it was bioluminescent, how, maybe that's what it does to attract other animals. Um, so the mace, maybe the reason why its mouth is so glowing this way is so that the flies can just fly into it. I'm not sure if these are flies or um, or other birds in the background. I think they're flies. Because flies are animals are attracted to light, like moths. So you could have done something like that, but it wouldn't really attract lots of moths, or they wouldn't chase after it. It would have to sit there very still. And those moths would just kind of come toward it, and it would just chomp them down like a Venus flytrap. So you basically redrew the redrew the um, redrew the the bat. I want a little something a little more innovative. Okay, so bat wings specifically. <clears throat> oh, do they? Oh, uh, no, frogs do eat them though. Fireflies attract mate with their glow. Yeah, they do. And then they eat them. The females eat the males. A whole bat. Yeah. So yeah, don't 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 just redraw the whole animal though. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these. Uh, this is a redraw, a complete redraw of inspiration folder. You're not supposed to use inspiration folder as the, um, the main source. Um, this is just the head piece. It looks really awesome, but I'm not sure which, it, which it's based off of. It should have the basic skeletal structure of the, uh, of the lizard, so there should be something happening that is really similar to the lizard. Um, it just feels like a really, really strong shape, very, very basic um, shape that isn't being divided into sub pieces, where there isn't much, uh, much of the cube involved in the way you've rendered it. Lots of circles, which isn't really good for the design, especially if you're bringing in sudden triangles for the, oopsie, for the, uh, for the jaw. So it feels like a very general shape. Um, these look great. But make sure they're always based off some of the anatomy you have. This is completely off the anatomy, off the anatomy. This is a, I think it's like a part of a chimera, isn't it? Um, so just stay close to the references as much as possible. It's not just about drawing creatures. It's about training yourself to work for someone. And that person comes in with their own restrictions. This is a belly crawler. Beautiful. It's got short legs. Beautiful. It's got these wings, but the wings, what role do they play, really, in its, in, its, in its function? We can't just make ridiculous creatures that we see in movies that make zero sense. Um, so we have to think about uh, what role do these wings play. Can it fly? If it can, these wings should be massive. They should be huge in order to carry this massive, really, really heavy lizard-like object up. Crawlers usually never become flyers. Um, I've never seen a crawler become a flyer that was a lizard. Um, we've really yet to see um, something like a dinosaur flying. Um, it's just such a heavy object. It would have to be so huge. The wingspan would have to be colossal in order to lift that object up. 
um, and it would have to live somewhere really high in the sky. It would not be living on the ground. <clears throat> um, the only lizard that does fly, the only one that does actually take flight, it doesn't really take flight, it just glides. So it's more of a gliding lizard than a flying lizard. Those catfish whiskers are called barbels, if that helps. Oh, thank you. Um, over here, I think what I see is the eye. If the eye is over here, um, it really wouldn't make sense for the creature. It would have to be blind, um, because it really would be trusting its, its sense of smell. So I recommend really, really throwing in um, real indication of its nose structure. And it's a snout. Really just obvious, obvious snout. Because it seems like it's, it kind of reminds me of a bat face. And then if you want to add an eye, the eye is usually pretty close to the nose. It's kind of like a connected system with animals and humans and other creations. So I recommend the eye being a little bit closer over here. Instead of back here, where it's really hidden, it's part of the neck. Um, it's it's just there. Sometimes there's a really basic structure that is for animals, and if it doesn't follow that structure, what we've seen successfully followed in evolution, then the animal dies off because it's really just a. It's just it's just a, on a on a straight road to extinction. If it can't see and smell, there has to be something that it's gaining out of that loss. It's losing a lot of sight if the if the eyes are in the neck. Okay, so I'm just um, bringing in more anatomy, and then we can throw the eye in. And it can be a, like a funny looking cow eye, or it could be, you know, to lessen the amount of sight it has, or it could be a full eagle kind of structure, really strong kind of structure for the eye. Full predators, full scary ass fucking predators, like um, King of the Jungle, or of the Serengeti, I guess, or, um, you know, big cats and big dogs, Tyrannosaurus rex, everything has perfect sight and perfect hunting abilities, is nocturnal, can, can exist in the day, can run around in the day, it's not completely nocturnal, it's just basically a killing machine. Its entire role is to eat off other animals, so it's been given the, given the strength to chase them, to catch them, to bite them, to overpower them with its strength, to be strong in numbers, to cooperate, to have prides, to have communities, to have a social order. It really, animals, uh, big cats, um, have social orders, especially ones that travel in, in packs or prides. It's a lot that goes into thinking about these animals. It's, it's just wild. I think a lot about it. It'll, it'll come back in the way you create people and the way you create um, characters. So just a little bit more of a read, I guess. And we're thinking more about that, like if the eye was back here, I'm not even sure if there was an eye, but uh, before, after. It isn't finished, so I don't blame you. Um, just on how to make the snout look really snouty is just to make a, the edge really, really strong right over here and make it cr gradually become a cave like I showed you guys the cave and the pearl and all of that. So nearly done. And now it feels like it's a crawler, it's a predator, it'll catch its prey, its hands aren't really going to help it eat its feet. Usually other animals catch and hold down other animals with its, with its feet. Um, but uh, the wings are questionable. They can just be there for design or leftovers. I mean, there's a lot of pieces on our bodies that are left over that we haven't devolved from or evolved from. Um, but uh, but I guess this this is excusable or forgivable um, if if it serves the purpose to heat it or to cool down the animal. Maybe that's the only reason why nature kept it. It's just to keep it cool and all the sun. Uh, a little bit work on the armor it definitely add the, to the design, add to the fact that this might be the king of the jungle. Um, in the way they designed Avatar, if we look at the Thanator, I think it was called. Um, yeah, it is. It's just, it's got the agility, it's got the, the agile kind of body. So its gesture line is definitely the gesture line of a hunter, of a runner, of a catcher, of a keeper downer. 
Um, it's got the color that it can afford, so it's not, it lives in a jungle, so it can have all the color. And if it was, if it had lived in a terrain that was um, a little darker, a little less, uh, not darker, but a little bit more, uh, you know, less in vegetation, less in variety. Like if, it, if it's main, one of its main foods is this purple plant, maybe that's why it's purple. Um, but uh, this is pretty much was explained in the movie. And there's this whole section. It's really cool. When they made this movie, they explained all the concepts that went behind it. If you guys catch that on YouTube, um, it basically explains the entire uh, biological structure or the, the ecosystem of, um, of the planet. I forget what it's called. But, but uh, he, he had all of the flash. He had all of the, the flare. He had the body of a cheetah. He had six legs. He could catch. He could keep it down. Its, it's eyesight was maximized. It had stuff to chew down bones and break down. The jawline was massive. The, 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 the neck was huge, very much like a hyena. Short tail, massive aerodynamic power, and lots of ability to catch or climb with these weird-ass legs. <laughs> um, so that's what you want to think about when you think predator. When you think prey, so what was another animal that was really was kind of useless? forget what it was but it was a really prey like animal but all of the animals that were showcased in Avatar really had their own you know they were big shots they were those big shot animals so the flying animals the flying flying creatures they tamed um, the that weird shrub eating animal this one I think it was this one oh yeah this right here this this big flashy animal that uses its its um its little gill I don't know what they're called their little um feathers <laughs> to scare other animals. Look at the massive blunt force it can produce, but I'm sure it's very squishy in the belly area. Also really colorful because of the jungle environment. But if you look at the animals designed um, in John Carter, which is the opposite of the environment in uh, an avatar, really uh, you just find the repetition of the color theme. Um, short legs, runners, um, they can cross long, long distances maybe because of the gravity. Is really light because the the planet is, or the, actually the gravity is sh stronger because they're in Mars. So why didn't they address that? Oh, yeah, he should have been he shouldn't have been able to jump like that. Wait, the Earth is bigger, so gravity is less. Mars is smaller, so gravity is more. He shouldn't have been able to jump like that. That was stupid. Um, so all of the animals here really really dulled down colors. Nothing is vibrant or anywhere is vibrant. As the, as the designs we see in Avatar. Okay? So just remember, the environment is the creature. Write that back to me. The environment is the animal itself. Okay, so let's close this down. Uh, shut down. Yes. Yes. Um, more flying creatures. I really like the way you've combined the pincers here. Short legs, uh, probably for landing or keeping its ground. It's probably attacking with this, just like a beetle does. Really, really strong, wide span for the wings. I recommend even bigger to keep it in, in flight. I like how it's light only around here, so it seems to have that moth body. So its legs here don't need to be big, so they shorten to keep it light, to keep it in the air. Um, this probably helps it, or this is just part of the anatomy of the moth. It feels like, yeah, it, it does prey on other animals, probably small birds. I like the turnaround here. Beautiful job. But yeah, its weakness would have to be these legs, which if it lost, I guess, would still function. Um, its color should be vibrant in a sky environment. If there is a lot of vegetation, if it's a rocky sky or a jungly sky environment, um, Insects don't really breathe that much, so you, this is a really, really good design for any creature that, that keeps itself really, really high. Remember that the more important the function, what's moving the most in, an, in a flying creature, it's wings. So it's going to be the most decorated, the largest part. If you really think about the bone structure of birds compared, or the, the main body of a bird compared to its wings, it basically looks like a rat without its wings. It's such a small part. The biggest part of a bird is its wings, because that's the thing that's moving most. Everything is designed around it. The lightness of its bones, the hollowness of a bird's bones. Everything is designed so that those wings successfully flap. The environment is the creature. Beautiful. So next time you guys create a creature, put a creature together, um, always ask yourself these questions that we've asked today. Um, okay, so this is a full-on predator. Full predator mode. 
um, tiny eyes, big tongue, um, the, the, the agile gesture line for the, for, the, for the body, really, really long legs covering lots of distances. Probably this is what it's used for its main defense. Probably venomous because of the massive color it has. If, a, if an animal, um, there's a proverb, an Arabic proverb. It says, if you wear feathers in, in war, you get ready to be, you know, get ready to be noticed. You're going to be the one everyone's going to try to fight. So there, there, there was a great warrior that always wore feathers um, at the very top of his helmet whenever there was a battle. In ancient times, in the times of Muhammad. Um, so whenever he wore the feathers, you know, that was him. If you have the balls to come find me is basically what the feathers are saying. If you have the balls to come find me, uh, you know, my feathers are way up there. You can find me, you know, from, from 100 yards away in the, in the heat of battle. <clears throat> so that's what people went to, and he would defeat them all. So that's pretty much what the feathers are in this case. When you have really, really bright colors, if you're a predator, you can get away with it. If you're a, not a predator, if you're a prey or if you're some sort of in-between because you're too bulky and no one wants to fuck with you, um, you probably don't have any color at all, but if you are the prey, um, you probably don't want to get yourself noticed. You probably don't want to wear the feathers on the battlefield. Um, so if you are bringing in colors, make sure the colors match the color color palette of the environment you're painting. Um, make sure it sits in the same area. So if the sand is found from here, so if you're choosing sand shades from here, it should be on the same curve. They should be neighboring. So you should choose really, really peachy colors. If they are purpley, again, that's only in the jungle. If you have some kind of environment that feeds that kind of uh, really, really cool, toxic kind of color. But in the environment of a, like an open environment in a savanna or a, or a or Sahara, um, <clears throat> did I say savanna? Serengeti, yeah. Uh, we uh, we want to add in really, really warm colors so they can complement. If we bring in these freaky shades right here, this is all venom. Um, this is all accredited to the venom, to the brightness of it. Uh, so I, I know about some predators that have warnings for their prey. They, they are in themselves have a warning. Uh, but I forget where I heard that. I think that's just a theory. But I, can, I guess the, the, the prey, the last thing it would see was the color before the creature attacked it. So I think it was an open mouth of a snake or something like that. Or the feathers or the way they shake or the animal, the, the, the sound of a snake's um, rattle. But uh, but there was an animal that <clears throat> that the color that it produced was a kind of a warning sign for the creature. In the I don't know where I saw that. Uh, probably in that one documentary, Mother Earth or whatever, um, I don't know what it's called, Life? I think it's called Life. Well, Mars has a gravity of 3.7, which is much smaller than Earth's. Yeah, but it's the size, right? So yeah, the greater gravity is less, but the size is smaller, so it's more compact, so it feels heavier, doesn't it? Doesn't it, wouldn't it be heavier? But no, the moon is lighter. Fuck you, Magic School Bus. Magic School Bus told me that the bigger the planet, the less gravity, the smaller the planet, the bigger, the heavier the gravity. I guess it's relative to the animals in it already. Um, Avatar Wiki says Pandora had a gravity 20% less than that of Earth. Had to look it up because dork. 20% <laughs> less. Um, so that would mean that why would it? Why would the animals need four wings or the big one? The, you know the big predator of the sky, the one that he tamed at the very end of Avatar. Why would it need so many wings if the gravity was already so light? Maybe all it needed was a couple extra wings to be in flight because it's a pretty heavy creature. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a give and take. <clears throat> yeah, frogs have bright colors to look poisonous. Yeah. Density, you're right. Yeah. Gemmy. Jemmy. Gemmy Joe. Jemmy Go. Jemmy. Jemmy Joe. Density, yes, you're right. I need to look into that again. But lots and lots of stuff today. Beautiful gesture. This is a flawless design, in my opinion. It just needs a couple more, you know, a bit more rendering, less line dependency in its rendering. But this, this is just gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. Beautiful design. Very, very successful. Doesn't look like it can get away with it. And it can glide. Fuck, man. Everybody run away. <laughs> this thing will fuck you up. Holy shit. Beautiful design. Probably my favorite of the batch. I don't, I don't like choosing favorites, but this one really, really speaks to me. It feels like something I would have seen in, in, uh, in John Carter or in Avatar. It really does. I always refer to those two movies because they really did really well with their creature design. Like, they, they spent a lot of money on those artists, which I really love. So remember, Thursday, there's another creature design critique hour. Maybe not for the whole class because I've pretty much gone through all of them today. Um, but if you have anything else... 
please submit it before then to the to the community okay so thanks everyone for coming have a great day bye bye guys